Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to start this thing off. Accord is the next great Bitcoin transaction protocol. That's right. This is your crypto bro path to happiness. And I'm going to talk about how you can make a million dollars today with Accord. You didn't expect that, did you, Blake? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, on the money, yeah. How's everyone's summit going? Is this good? <sighs> We're almost through, right? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> day two is hard, huh? Because you burn hard the first day, and you're like, I can do this two days. Then you wake up, and you're like, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah, that's what I always feel like we should have, like, a day and a half con conferences. Like, a two-day late conference. And, like, reInvent is literally a week now. It's Sunday to Saturday now. What's that? A long morning? I'm like, yeah, we could do that too. Yeah. We start at 3 a.m. and end at noon. <laughs> we'll start at midnight. <laughs> I know some of you are probably like, that's the middle of the day for me. All right. 4.10. I think this is when I'm supposed to start. I don't know. I'm kind of losing track of time. So I'm supposed to be entertaining. Oh, man. Josh. <laughs> Let's do this. All right. Everybody loves acid. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> uh, it's funny. I just read an article about how Silicon Valley is the acid capital of the world. And I'm like, yeah, that's my talk tomorrow. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, come on. The jokes are easy, right? Let's just go. Um, OK, so here's, uh, here's everybody. So uh, when I've talked to uh, any user about Cassandra since 19, <laughs> no, it was probably around 2011, 2012. Um, this is the thing I keep hearing, like, oh, yeah, Cassandra's awesome, man. Uptime is awesome. Scale is awesome. But I need transactions. And I get it. I mean, we all have lived, you know, we're like Barbies living in a Barbie world, right? We're living in, like, relational database world. I've been using relational databases since a long time ago. And that's what we all expect. They were built around acid transactions, right? Um, Oracle started this whole thing in the 80s, and it's just gone crazy since. So... It's, it's not weird, so we're just going to have to deal with this. So there are three use cases. I'm going to talk about three use cases, macro use cases, that Cassandra can't do yet. And this is what I've always had to talk around. Now, it's either you don't do it or you make up something super crazy. Hey, guys, how you doing? <laughs> We've done that. Um, <laughs> you're like, oh, it doesn't have transactions? Let's use magic and code to make it work, right? And you can fake it, but you're putting a lot of work on yourself and not on the database. So number one, bank transactions. The classic, right? Even though banks would actually work like this. Um, you know, it's this thing of like exclusively moving from one table to another. That's, that's the big deal, right? There's this, there's this order, like this thing happened before that. The exclusivity, you know, that it, it's only one person or one process making a change. Um, many of you know, because you were at dinner with me last night, this is a mid-journey image. <laughs> I asked it to give me an Alice to Bob, and there was Alice giving Bob a big fat stack of Benjamins, say. <laughs> but that's a transaction. Um, this is a hard one, right? This is probably the number one thing that people talk about when they talk about transactions is like, oh, I want to be able to do a bank transaction because people love money, right? And money, if money gets lost, that's a data loss that hurts, right? Because if your bank loses your money, you're probably not going to work with that bank anymore. Inventory management. Uh, and it's, this is one that I think once you understand the problem, it, this is probably more of an issue with like, inventory is being finite. So it's not that you have inventory. It's that eventually you're going to go to zero. Uh, a good example is if I want to buy a PlayStation 5 and there's only five left, you know, you all had this problem, right? <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> right? <laughs> the PlayStation 5 um, and there's five left and everybody clicked. Who wins? Well, what you don't want is you find out that you are now, you now have negative 300 PS5s in inventory. That's just not, an, that's not a normal number. It's not okay. So 
um, you need to be able to be precise and first come, first serve. And it's a high concurrency problem too. Like if you have one record in your database that says PlayStation 5 and here's your inventory account, that's a problem. So this is another issue that definitely stay away from. And then finally, the distributed ledger. I told you there's going to be Bitcoin in here. Um, but actually, this is much more than just Bitcoin. It's, it's a more generalized problem. Of like, um, and this is one that's really tough. It's like the changes have to be in, in order, but also it has to it, adhere to some sort of timing as well. Um, this happened before that. And this is wall clock. Uh, if you talk about consensus protocols, there's the real time. Like, If I'm sitting there looking at the clock and the second hand ticking, I want to know that the order is, I clicked here, and then that person clicked here, I win, right? It, there's no funny math when it comes to time. Time is supposedly an arrow. So that, and that's a really hard problem, is sticking to that. So what needs to change in Cassandra? Or I should say, what has changed in Cassandra? Because this has been, spoiler alert, this has been working. This has been happening for a while. So what needs to change? Well, this is a... A great, uh, if, if you want to know more about consistency levels, I've been going back to this Jepson website for a long time um, just because this is a really good explanation of consistency levels as you can find because they're gathered in one place. Um, and I, I love this, this chart. I've been using it for a while. And it just shows you the hierarchy. You know, and, um, The higher you go, the, more the stronger the consistency, the lower you go down, YOLO. And, um, you know, we... We fit, Cassandra has fit in various places in that, but really serializable, see if there's, if you notice there's a fork in the road here, there's, over here is linear, linearizable, God, these words. Um, and then serializable, I don't even think those are real words, but we made it a word. They fork off, they're two different things, right? Well, serializable is the one that uh, is really the current limit of distributed databases where people are at, it's like, and these are like, the spanners, auroras, cockroach, yoga bite. And the reason is, is because, and they're very clear, like you go to the cockroach website, they'd say, hey, we are serializable and this is why. Because to make it linear, it is super hard. And it's not that it's impossible, the costs are too high. Like to do it, it just takes too much time and resources. And users would have a terrible experience. So it's just a trade-off. It's not a terrible trade-off, but it is a trade-off. Um, it's really, it's maintaining that strict sequence. So you don't have this race condition where one process overwrites another. And that current limited distributed databases is good enough for a lot of things, but not the best. And what we want to say, oh, current, that's the current living. I'm not, sorry, my slide is messed up. It should say, we're Cassandra, and what we're trying to accomplish with Cassandra, with Accord, is taking it all the way to the top. To strict serializable, so you get the strict sequence and the real-time ordering. And uh, that's a pretty squishy word, strict serializable. <laughs> um, there's a lot of definitions out there, but really the thing you need to understand is that it's not just, not just the order of like when you did it, but it's also the wall clock time and maintaining that time order, um, which is a great way to not lose data in the long run. Because all of these, the only reason we care about consistency in a database is because we have situations that could lose data or have overwrite. And so the lower you go down, the more of those cases can happen. The higher you go up, and this is the best thing, is you can be super lazy. So the developer experience, as I said, is around this whole business of, you know, we in the Cassandra community have decided to put features lighter in the database at first. You know, it's very much, you know, put and get, but we put a lot of complexity on the, on the developer. That has been evolving and changing for a while. And that's good because what we're doing is we're making, because developers are like, yeah, no. <laughs> Remember Thrift? It was awesome. <laughs> um, but you had to really understand how to write good code to not destroy your data. So as we make more features available for the database, we make it easier for developers to write code against it. And it really just transfers all that complexity over to the database where it belongs. And it really is where databases have been for a while, right? I mean, I was an Oracle DBA, don't judge, but you know, there was a lot of complexity put into that. And so whenever I wrote a very simple SQL command, I knew lots of stuff happened, but I also trusted it, right? I, well, <laughs> after like nine, <laughs> eight was, eh. <laughs> but after nine, it was totally solid. Um, but 
you know, you just trust what that does. But I didn't have to write a lot of complex code. I just threw it all in the database and figured it out, right? Um, and because I'm a lazy developer, right? As we all should be. We should all be lazy developers. And the, the difference, too, is this, this, this observer reference frame. And um, this is not a physics thing. This is about, like, as you're doing something with your application, you want to feel like you know, you're the only one there. This is what you want to feel like. And this is you. I'm the only one using the database, right? Even though there could be thousands and thousands of processes using the database. You don't want to have to think. I mean, if anyone's had to think through a race condition, yeah, yeah, I see the faces. Thinking through race conditions are hard because you just, I mean, they're kind of amorphous and weird and they usually aren't firmed up. Like there's no deterministic way to say this is a race condition because they just occur and that's why they suck. So let's just avoid that completely. You just want to look like you're the only person working on a database. All right, liven up everyone, we're almost done. <laughs> All right, so. The, I talk about this a lot with this, but it's, it is a thing. Pat Helland, I love this article, like this uncoordinated business. It's like the more we have to think about coordination, the worse off we are because it is a hard problem. It requires a lot of thinking. So just start working on uncoordinated as possible because coordination is expensive. It is the most expensive operation you do on a database. That's why whenever we write data into Cassandra at a um, consistency level of one, it's super cheap, right? What's the fastest way? Well, any, don't use any. <laughs> but one is fast, right? And why? Because it just YOLOs the data right into the database and just drops it in and doesn't do anything to check it. Doesn't, like, it really is, comes right back. Great. And that's very cheap operation because it's a single node operation mostly. And when you start thinking about all the coordination that needs to happen, it gets really expensive. So we don't want that. So that we're, we're, we need to have a single system experience with a distributed system. And it's, I'm not saying it's the holy grail, but I'm saying it's pretty tough. So back in the day, uh, 1989 to be exact. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Top movie in 1989 was Lethal Weapon 2 and behold, Paxos. <laughs> um, I saw Lethal Weapon. I didn't know about Paxos in 89. So, okay. But Paxos is actually, if I look at it now, after years of looking at it, uh, it's actually not too hard. Um, it's, it's easy to reason through. It's impossible to implement. Um, I think we just nailed it in the Cassandra project this week, <laughs> last week. <laughs> I mean, it's been a process, right? Um, but it, it's just, it's kind of the, the, the headwaters of all consensus protocols, Paxos, right, back in the day. Um, and it's this thing like if one system in the distributed system says, hey, I want to make a change, it proposes that to everyone else, all the other nodes are like, cool, and then if it gets a cool back from everybody, it does it. And um, if one says no, then it starts again. So, but it is this, it's a consensus protocol, meaning it has to get consensus. You can't have naysayers, right? Um, and Blake, remember that time we argued about ePaxos? Uh, e oh yeah, that, that's where I got my Paxos knowledge uh, back in the day. We had a great time arguing about it. You won, you won by the way. <laughs> but Paxos is, it, it's not an overly complicated thing, but it's, when you look at it, you're like, oh, there could be a lot going on there. Yes, that's actually true. It, it can go back and forth. You can have like under high contention, like there's one, uh, one thing that everybody's trying to change, all the processes are trying to change, it can get really noisy, right? Because everyone's like, I want to change it, I want to change it, I want to change it, and they overlap, and they're like, no, yes, no. It's like Congress. Anyway, <laughs> Spanner saved us all. Just kidding. Uh, Spanner was a good idea. 2012, when that came out, a little later than Paxos, but Spanner is really just multi-Paxos. And it... Still, the Paxos still applies, but it uses some method to make sure that from one Paxos domain to another, it maintains that, that sequencing, that serialization. Um, the spanner, like the Google spanner, they have their own, you know, true time, you know, some atomic clock sitting in like a dark room somewhere. But uh, there are other databases that use the spanner protocol or spanner paper, they, they're derivative, like, um, cockroach is a good example where they said, hey, we don't have atomic clocks, right? 
So they, they implemented their own way to keep things synchronized. I believe they use vector clocks. Um, and then uh, Yogabyte is also a spanner, but they used another thing as well. So it, it's all kind of based on the same thing. You have these multi-paxos, and then you have this coordination layer. Um, what that means is inserts can be really expensive. And that's, I think that is the, the downside of span. Reads are not that hard because you turn into read replicas. But that's really bad for Cassandra because, and this is why I'm going to point that out, is because it creates this unnatural situation for Cassandra. Now we have to like do all this massive coordination between data centers, um, which it's, it's too much. We want to think about in terms of like we want to scale like the way we want to scale, like add a node. Um, we want to do five data centers, not just two. Um, and we don't want to have to change up your data modeling. Like you can't change that partition key because it's in a different data center. Um, you know, those are weird things that we'll start throwing at users. Remember, developer experience is a good thing. The, better, the easier it is to use, the less mistakes you'll make. So Accord, and I know there's probably something wrong on here yet, but keep it really high level. It really is, was designed for Cassandra, the way Cassandra works. And it's just leaderless, it scales like Cassandra, the failure modes match up. And that's one of the things with consensus protocols, which are really hard. Like, what happens when you have a failure? A node goes offline. You don't want to have to, like, stop everything, hold on, and reelect the leader and come back online. That, that is not a Cassandra experience. We want it so that, and, and y'all love to talk about it, but it's a thing, and I'm going to bring it back with, Span with uh, Accord. I'm going to start destroying Raspberry Pis with a hammer because <laughs> that's the experience you want, right? You want to have lightning strike your data center and not have any downtime, right? That, that, that's the dream we should all have, and Cassandra can do that. But we shouldn't say, oh, but if you want acid transactions, then all that's out the door. That's super lame. Let's not do that. So what about usage? Let's get into using it. Look at my clock. We're doing good. All right. How do we use, uh, what is it about uh, Accord and what we do with ASM transactions with Cassandra? There is some syntax. Stand by. <laughs> um, and I think that this is still pretty firm. If, if not the case, uh, I don't know, Blake, Ariel, somebody tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, Caleb, I think you're in here too. Uh, but anyway, this is the current version. And what's new is adding this begin transaction, commit transaction. That's, that's your block, right? That's your thing that says inside of here, acid do occur. And uh, inside of it, I'm going to break that down a bit too. Um, first things first, uh, there's a way that we can collect like this current state of the data before we do a mutation. And that's like this let command is, and you can put it into a tuple and basically do a pre-select off, like what am I gonna change? And this comes in handy in a minute. Um, you can also do a select that will show you the change after you run if this was successful. So this is like a before and after setup. This is where all the magic occurs. And it's really cool. We have this if statement that checks that tuple condition. So that's why we grabbed that tuple. So we can look at what's, what was the state of that data and then make a decision. Now, I will walk you through some examples that will bring this home. But like I said, this is where the magic is because when you have this conditional and then inside of that, you can have updates, inserts, deletes. That conditional is where you make some really interesting decisions around things. This is going to come in super handy for a lot of things like inventory control. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of use cases here. The bank transaction, right? Here we go. Alice is going to give Bob some money. So here's my setup. Here's my table. Um, I have a, an account table. And um, just real simple, I have who has the money and how much money do they have. And I give, <laughs> I'm giving um, Alice and Bob 100 bucks. 100, 100 decimals, you know, the real money that you can use. Probably Bitcoin at this point, right? Crypto. <laughs> so if they both have 100, I'm, I'm going to walk through the transaction. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab Alice's, uh, because I'm moving money from Alice to Bob, I'm going to grab Alice's bank, uh, bank balance. Like how much does uh, Alice have an account? 
Um, I'm also going to emit how much, after it's done, how much Alice has after the transaction. Like I said, this is where the magic is. What I'm going to do is because I'm going to move $20 from Alice to Bob, right? I want to make sure that Alice has that money in there. I do not want to overdraw. I know this is not a really good bank thing. Of course banks want to overdraw you because that's how they make money, right? Um, but anyway, let's just imagine that we have, we're a good bank. We don't want to overdraw, have our people overdraw. So we don't want to overdraw the account. So what we do is we check to see if that account balance is greater than or equal to 20. If it is, Alice has enough money to give Bob, and it happens. So if you look over here, you see the update. There's two updates that happen. There's, and there, there's another syntax that I absolutely love. Now the update can do a plus equals, minus equals. <laughs> Blake's smiling because he knows I love this so much. I wish we just had this in the regular syntax, by the way, and so does Aaron. Um, but if we just do able to increment, we can increment this, uh, this in place. So we'd say an update. So take 20, 20 bucks from Alice, give 20 bucks to Bob. That all happens wrapped up in a transaction. I commit the transaction, we're done. Now, before you ask, no, there's no rollback. I know. And you want to leave? All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> Rollback's a different problem. <laughs> Inventory management. Um, this one is also super cool because this is one I've never been able to solve well with Cassandra. It just is a super hard problem. It's an intractable problem for many cases. So I have some products in a product table. I have my shopping cart. Probably all of you have created this at one point in your life. So I'm going to insert that PlayStation 5. I'm going to put 100 PlayStation 5s into, into the product because probably this is not even how many were there back in the day. It was weird. Like they would get like, like Best Buy would get 20, Walmart would get 20. Like what? <laughs> Did they meet somewhere? But anyway, limited inventory. There's only 100. Now, what I'm going to do, same type of thing, set up. I'm going to look to see what the current inventory is. And this is all locked. When I start this transaction, this is all locked now. I'm going to look at the current inventory for PlayStation 5s. I'm going to emit the, the inventory after I'm done. But then, again, this is where I make sure that I don't go past zero. So. Um, if the inventory is greater than zero, then I'm going to update, uh, I'm going to change the inventory, decrement it down one, so there's one less PlayStation in the world, and then I'm going to insert it into my shopping cart. Yes, I got a PlayStation. But yeah, I know. Thanks, Max. Um, but that's all happening in a transaction and locked under a highly concurrent workload. All those idiots clicking on the buy button, right? It's going to be okay. Relax. Because the database has got you. And that's impossible to do without it being in the database. I'm just going to say that. It's impossible. It needs to be closer to the wire um, where the data exists. And what this does, so in a highly contended load, if I had, here's where that, the order and the linearity comes in. If I have two people that click really close to each other, they're still milliseconds apart. So because Max was really excited too, and he was just a millisecond late, I got the PlayStation. Sorry, Max. Sorry. Last one. <laughs> but, you know, wah wah. Uh, you don't want to send your customer an email saying, sorry, we totally blew past the inventory. Here's a coupon. <laughs> Is that what you guys do at Walmart? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, so, but think about, like, this isn't just shopping cart or inventory. Think about other things where this applies. Again, these are general patterns, but a good example of how this works. Um, I built this thing as funny as like, yeah, I want to make this to sell my book. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I can't even give them away. So there's still 10 in inventory. So, um, <laughs> but this is like the thing that I think about is like, oh, the thundering herd app. Like people are like, it's, get it now, click. This used to be scary, now it's not. Now, um, I don't have a really good distributed um, ledger one. I actually was trying to come up with a really good one. Yes, that's an interesting problem. Yes, that's one we can't do with Cassandra. But I actually want to go after something that has been impossible to do well, but I think has more applicability for the Cassandra community, which is this real atomic batch. Now, when I say real, uh, some of you may realize that there was a controversy or know about this controversy. We used, 
There at one point, somewhere in the docks, somewhere, there, the batch in Cassandra was called Atomic. Yeah, you want to start a fight in the Cassandra mailing list? Call it Atomic Batches. <laughs> oh, people start throwing out definitions. That's, a, that's not Atomic. And so, and of course, it, they weren't really. It just got named that and unfortunate naming. But I'm here to save the day. I'm going to be a peacemaker. You can actually do it now. So think of this, and this is a very common pattern in Cassandra where you have a, a base table like a user, but then you create lookup tables. User by email, user by location. Now, these are index tables. Now, if I was to change something in my user record, like their city or by their email address or something like that, I need to update the index tables as well. Now, you could do that with a batch, but the batch is non-deterministic, right? It's, it will, uh, well, it will eventually happen, it's eventually consistent, but it isn't a acid transaction. I'm not changing all my tables at the same time. Um, and what this is, the same thing, I'm gonna check, I'm gonna say, does this person even exist? So I'm gonna make sure and not do anything that doesn't exist. And this is that example of that, you know, if the tuple is null, right? Um, that is an interesting problem, right? So what I'm doing is I'm actually creating a situation where um, if this person exists, I'm not going to stomp on them. But if, if, I, if the account doesn't exist, then I'm going to create a brand new one. Now, I can also do updates. Like if I wanted to change my account, um, that would be a different conditional. But in this case, what I'm doing is making sure that um, lightweight transactions, let me, let me quickly stop here. Lightweight transactions do this for one partition. If you need to do more than one, wah wah. So this is how you do that multi-partition change. And it's just built into the database. So cool. OK, doing great on time. So when can I get it? Ariel, thank you. <laughs> um, CP15 Accord, it's a branch right now. Uh, it, you can go download it and build it yourself. If you need help with that, hit me up. Um, I was going to build a Docker image, but I didn't get time because, you know, I was hanging out with you guys, um, but, which was worth it. It's all good. <laughs> but uh, I, am, I think I'm going to still do that. Maybe, maybe this weekend, <sighs> if I have time. But no, I want to create a Docker image around this because it's not a part of any official release right now. So I have to do it as an individual, not as an official project thing. But the target release is 5.1. As you heard me maybe say this in the keynote yesterday, uh, it was originally slated for 5.0. Um, after some discussion in the mailing list, <laughs> some, some light banter back and forth, <laughs> some uh, easy discussion about like differences between one version or another, because we just love each other in the mailing list, and this is what we do. Um, we decided that uh, we're going to decouple uh, the Accord and, and Transactional Cluster Metadata, TCM, uh, from 5.0, just to let 5.0 ship. It's got everything, so it's in beta right now. Go, go play with it. But 5.1 ha will have, um, like, there'll be a fast follow and we'll have the Accord in that. But, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of, um, I think the, the important thing is that we all realize that this is a major change to Cassandra. Um, was like 88,000 lines of code got touched or... That, does, that, does that seem like a number? Anybody want to say yes or no? Oh, that was just TCM. <laughs> just TCM was AT. So, yeah, it's a big one. Um, but when you touch that much code in any consensus protocol, we want to really make sure we test it a lot and make sure, you know, because we as a project, and we, we hold dear quality, right? And that's important. And that's what we all agreed to in the mailing list. <laughs> no, it's, it's a matter of um, just making sure to give it enough room. And that, I think that's fine. But I do think it's important for everyone who's uh, interested in using um, transactions with their next application to get out there and start getting used to the, to the syntax, because it is different. You're going to have to learn about it. You're going to have to figure out how it fits in your application and just you know, it's, it's just knowing how it works. Now, understanding that, you know, trusting it beyond the way, there's a lot of testing going on, that sort of thing. But just get the syntax right. I think that's what I want to recommend. Um, this QR code goes directly to that branch, if you want to go to there. Um, and then finally, um, thank you very much. I, I think I nailed the timing. <laughs>
Max, questions? Transaction template. Uh, what I would really, really love to see is, is find its way into some frameworks. Um, like, you know, there's a lot of frameworks now. I, you know, Aaron's talk about Mongoose, for instance. Mongoose is a JavaScript framework for Cassandra. Um, if I just think that would be cool to see that just magically get awesomer. But it, under this, under the covers, it's using transactions. So. Uh, no particular templates right in like in Cassandra, but I think I would like to see this go out into the ecosystem and just become more of that. Spring is another one. Spring Data um, has some some hooks in it that I would love to now be able to use. That's a good example. Yeah. Second question. Uh, yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, Let me have you. Uh, just, like, oh yeah. Captured on the yeah. Thank you for Mike. Uh, second question. Um, I. Trust you created uh, a lot of different ways to check the condition, but is there a very chance for at some point of time we are going to be able to upload our jar to Cassandra and do very complicated checks for the condition before we enter the locked state? A very complicated check. Like, what would be an example of a complicated check? Like a subselect, maybe? Or no, we have, you already do a select off your data. So anything that's supported in a select statement is available, you can create a tuple with. Uh, what if we have some, you know, complicated math around with math functions which are not supported? Oh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Cassandra. I don't know if that's really, does anyone know? I mean, like, if you wanted to do, like, a, a max or a min or something like that, or is that what you're talking about? Like, math functions. Yeah, math functions, but maybe more complicated than just max and min, you know. Or a count is another one that could be done, like, how many of these things. Yeah, I know. I got everyone laughing at me. You're like, oh, God, here it comes. See, you should never release code because now everyone wants more, right? <laughs> uh, there's no plans right now, but um, this is where I encourage you as a user of the system to join us in the Apache Software Foundation uh, Slack. There is one called Cassandra Accord. Um, right now, it's just a bunch of people trying to figure out how to compile it and make it work, and there's a lot of stuff that's going in there about the details. But I would love to see that transition more to, hey, I'm using it, and here's my experience. One thing I would say is historically, when you have a user defined function, you're so hard to ship out and execute arbitrarily in another context. It's a massive sort of security problem. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of been pretty challenging to thread that needle and provide support for that kind of thing. Yeah. Please find the sharing ticket sharing what you would like to do. This will help the community prioritize where we focus. Yeah, JIRAs are awesome because. And, it, and whenever you create a JIRA, and I'm, I'll say this because the camera's on, when you create a JIRA, you can say what subsystem it is, and you can say, yeah, this is for a court. And, and yes, those are, those are very valuable because, first of all, it's official, it's in the system, and it, gets, it can be followed up on, it can be routed, you know, assigned, all these things. So JIRA system is very good for, this is what we use in our Cassandra project. Yeah. Um, I think we're kind of out of, oh, do you have you one more question over here? More, yeah. So I noticed all of your examples had a single let. Is yes. it possible to have more than one let? Yes, you can have more than one let. Awesome. So is there, what, what's the limit? You know, I don't think we have one. Ah, nice. Yeah. This is, well, welcome to the world of guardrails. <laughs> we have not defined any for a cord yet. Um, yeah, guardrails is a 5 or a 4.0 uh, 4 concept. But um, yeah, I would... I think that part of this is we're going to find our guardrails right now. It's a little, like, go for it, and let's see where it breaks. Um, so, yeah, I expect we're going to find somebody. What do you mean I can't do 10,000 lets? <laughs> well, that's unusable. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be outside, but thank you.